Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Baruz, when you were writing No Friend But The Mountains on Manus, uh, which was done including through conversations through Facebook and WhatsApp, what were your original hopes for the manuscript? I'm guessing at the time you did not expect that it would be turned into a symphonic song cycle. Uh, thank you for having me. I think uh, uh, I should talk about the time that I was uh, working as a journalist in, in uh, Manus Island. And uh, so, as you probably know, I was working as a journalist for uh, many years and I was publishing journalism works. But uh, I thought that uh, actually journalism language is not capable that we expose the system. So that's why I shifted my work to uh, literature and art. Although when I ended up in Manus Island, I was thinking about this to write a book, but I didn't know that which language should I use. So after uh, a while I started to write and I think the, on that time I knew Omid very well through the journalism works because we were working together for such a long time. And uh, then I started to write the book. And uh, I remember I expected that we uh, get uh, large uh, readers, but, uh, and also I knew and I imagined that this book is going to actually shake the whole system, but I thought that it will take time. It will take at least 10 years that really this book find its way. Um, it actually, I was shocked when we got a huge uh, reaction from people in Australia and then later uh, all around the world. And, uh, but we expected that we get some uh, good attention, but not like this. Um, uh, and also we expected that on future uh, more artists and uh, academics engage with the materials that we create. And also I was thinking about uh, music actually. I expected that, but not in a short time, in two, three years that. And when Luke uh, approached me, uh, we had a long uh, conversation and uh, we discussed this. So in some ways I expected and in some ways not really. Luke, how did you discover the book and why did you decide it was the right piece of work to adapt into a, a, a symphonic song cycle? Well, I was working in Perth at the time and... I was working on my opera, Ned Kelly, and the singer, Adrian Tamburini, who's singing in the premiere of the song cycle, was reading Beruz's book. And he suggested that I have a read of it and get a copy myself because there was this brilliant flow between poetry and prose in the, in the book. And he thought there was a musicality there. So I bought the book, I read it, absolutely agreed. The music kind of leaped out from the page. And importantly for me, what I saw in, in the book was a unique, well, an Australian story, a recurring Australian story in our history, which is one of migration and incarceration, um, of which I was seeing Beruz's portrayal of these themes as the latest iteration of a recurring Australian story, um, certainly since, you know, uh, penal colonies and and convict times, but you know, throughout our history. And there were those themes, there were also themes of, of nature, which for me are really tied to a sense of Australian identity, a relationship with waves and the ocean, a particular look at the sky, unique flora and fauna. And so an image of a beautiful cage, if you like, a kind of gilded prison emerged from the book which for me chimed, as I say, with a sense of Australian identity and this contrast with kind of a, a literal prison 
alongside the idea of an island continent as a prison in itself. Um, and working on Ned Kelly, I was engaging in kind of explicit Australian identity themes through that work. And what I wanted to do was, was go deeper and find another kind of angle to do this. And that's what I saw in Beruz's book, um, an important Australian story to tell there. I mean, in the introduction to No Friends But the Mountains, you write about the challenges of translating the, quote, poetic resonances of the original Farsi phrases into English and also about the decision to keep those passages of poetry that punctuate the prose so strikingly and so beautifully. Talk to us about your role in this latest phase of the process of, uh, of this musical adaptation and and about the importance of maintaining the, the book's poetic integrity in the songs. Well, thank you for that really important question and very complex question. I'll try my best to summarise. Um, basically, uh, Behrouz was writing text messages from very early on in his, um, into his incarceration, and he was sending those text messages to his first translator, Munis Mansubi, um, whose translations actually led me to, to um, working with Behrouz. So Munis would collect these text messages that would range between one paragraph and maybe two or three pages. And um, basically she would combine them into um, chapters based on Behrouz's instructions. Then she would make them into PDFs, and then she would send me the PDFs. And while I was translating, Behrouz would be sending me more messages to insert. And so you can already imagine how complicated it is and, and how difficult it is for me to explain. But when I, when I was reading, uh, I knew it was a masterpiece, but at the same time, I was wondering, as someone who didn't have training in translation, uh, I was wondering how would I convert these really long sentences in Farsi into English because Farsi, um, uh, like a lot of Romance languages and also German, uh, has very long sentences with the subject at the beginning and the verb right at the end. And in between, you have all of these consecutive, complicated, varying clauses. So what I ended up doing was splitting up the long sentences into shorter sentences, which meant that I had to uh, repeat nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, phrases, so after about the third edit, after translating, because when I translated, everything was still one paragraph. The whole book was essentially one paragraph, or every chapter was one paragraph. So when I was splitting them all up and making it into some kind of um, uh, literary piece, uh, I noticed that uh, some of those sections that I, where I split up the sentences uh, looked more like poetry. And that's because the original sentence was melodic. It was rhythmic. It was poetic. So what we ended up deciding on doing was for certain sections to transform the, Engl the Farsi prose into English verse. And I think it worked really well. I agree, absolutely. I guess the, uh, the thing that immediately leaps from that, well, there's a couple of things I wanted to pick up on, but Baruz before we talk more about uh, the song cycle itself, to the idea of writing a book piecemeal, part by part, in paragraphs, many writers would be able to uh, uh, sit back and reread earlier parts of a manuscript, uh, edit as they go. Kind of, it must have been an enormous creative challenge for you, particularly under the circumstances you were contained in. Uh, to think about this as this body of work as a whole thing, how did you approach the writing of it? Were you focused on it as a body of work or were you focused on just making the individual parts as strong as they could be and hoping that the connections would later flow between them? Uh, actually, I think it is a good question because uh, just people think about this that uh, writing a book, a whole book on WhatsApp is difficult, but really people cannot imagine that what is the difficulties. You know, just they look at the whole picture that someone writes a book on a WhatsApp. But it's really difficult because I didn't have uh, this opportunity to really re-edit and uh, rewrite some uh, paragraphs of the book because uh, just I had to write it 
once and uh, so it was really difficult when you have a long uh, message in front of you on whatsapp on the phone and you really uh, work on it again and so that was really difficult and i'm sure if i had the computer i could do better you know and sometimes uh, i had this uh, conversation with omid for example when i finished a chapter and i said omid oh here is chapter five for example uh, i we had a long conversation and i said oh omid so i think so that paragraph you should take it off or this sentence or this word i mean it was like uh, talking you know sometimes it was like that and sometimes i had to uh, send the uh, email so it was messy actually because it was difficult to manage uh, all of this and another thing is that uh, you know in a normal situation the writers write a book finish it then get back to it and uh, edit it or work on it again or even some writers add a chapter or take off a chapter take off a paragraph but uh, in that circumstances we believe that we should uh, publish this book as soon as possible because we wanted to Uh, create change. The aim was not to create a literature uh, text. The aim was actually a political aim to challenge the system. So that's why uh, when I finished the chapter, Omid was translating in the same time. And I was working on uh, another chapter. So I mean, that was really difficult but of course uh, in in the end omid did a great job because he worked with the editor of the publisher i think it took like six months yeah mm-hmm. and another problem that i had i had to write in a way to protect uh, the people privacy so i was not uh, free actually to write about everything and that's why the characters actually i are not real characters so i had to mix some characters and create a new character that even when the refugees read it they really don't recognize which person am i talking about so that was really difficult and also I had to write it in a way that, uh, because, you know, when you come, like 600 uh, boats came to Australia in uh, four or five years. And uh, each boat has a different story, you know. And I hear many stories from other people. And I had to write it in a way that represent Uh, all of these journeys, you know, so it was uh, not only my personal story and the particular boat that I came with. Omid, given the uh, the collaborative nature of the writing process uh, that we've just heard about, uh, it seems then almost a logical extension of that process to involve a composer in the next iteration of this story and storytelling. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the, the development of this now into uh, the, the song cycle? Uh, and Luke, I'll get you to, to chime in as well, uh, just to, to talk about extending that collaboration that has already been built to now bring in music and uh, a musical voice to further enrich the piece. Amid, can, perhaps? Yeah, I'm really glad that you raised this because for me, one of the most important, one of the most special things about the book is what I call in my translator's note, a shared philosophical activity. So Beth has already talked about the conversations that took place while we were working on the book during the translation process. And these conversations, not just with Behrouz, but uh, with Munis, who was my, um, uh, she was my 
translation consultant, and also Sajad Kabgani, who is a, uh, but he's in Iran now, but he was a PhD student in uh, Sydney at the time. I worked with both of them. We had long conversations, sometimes hour long conversations about one word or one sentence. Um, and then there were other people who were interacting with, getting feedback from. Behruz had his own confidence. So basically, this was every, some of us didn't know each other, and you know we were all working towards the same goal. It was almost like we were one mind, many bodies, um, which is an interesting philosophical um, possibility <laughs> at the same time. Um, but uh, this shared philosophical activity, I think, is important because it talks about the way that there is a larger story to the book. It, it speaks to this uh, phenomenon of um, uh, of a frame narrative. So there's the, the book can be interpreted as a kind of um, smaller story with a much wider story. Um, and that wider story is this beautiful relationship that a group of friends and a, a group of activists, a group of creatives had together. And I think um, Luke is definitely part of that shared philosophical activity now. Um, and uh, Richard, you're part of it as well. I mean, everyone who comes in and supports us, everyone who gives us feedback, everyone who promotes the work and, 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 and uh, engages in this plight, in this um, uh, campaign, is part of this shared philosophical activity. And when Luke got in touch with me, I think about two years ago now, he, um, you know, we were talking about support letters and how to um, uh, attract other people into to invest in this in some way to to, to expand our uh, our network. Um, I, of course, you know, I, was, I looked up Luke and uh, wanted to see what kind of work he'd done in the past. And I think the first thing that came up on Google for me was uh, Luke's work, uh, Unborn in America. And uh, I automatically saw that uh, Jello Biafra wrote a really great review about uh, that work. And, uh, you know, Jello Biafra is or was the lead singer of uh, Dead Kennedys, uh, an amazing punk group. Uh, and I, I, I was auto automatically sold. So, um, you know, I think these radical connections are also really interesting, how they come together and how they, they feed each other and, uh, and how they attract different sensitivities. <laughs> Luke, do you want to pick up that conversation? Yeah, no, I love that. Um, unborn is certainly a political work. At the, the, at the center of it is an unborn fetus who gets elected president and ends up aborting the human race. Um, so it's a satirical cabaret opera, but with deeply serious um, issues around um, abortion at its center. Um, not just that, but lots of other things. And it's, you know, it's funny and it's kind of anarchic and yeah, political as satire is. So I'm glad that was the piece that that you listened to. Um, it's also a very lyrical work and it's for the voice. And, you know, that's a direct translation into uh, this new song cycle because having a voice at the center of this this new piece and that, you know, most human of musical sounds, the human voice um, is really key, I think, to translating a lot of these ideas into music. And talk to us a, just briefly, uh, perhaps, about the music itself to capture the emotional intensity of the book, the truth of the book, and the, the fact that it is beautifully written about terrible circumstances. How do you do yeah. justice to that? Sure. Well, I mean, if I was to translate the book into music, it would be a kind of week or a two week long event. So certainly the text that I chose is a tiny fraction of, of the book's complete text. And therefore it needed to tell its own story that was as compact as the amount of text that, that I chose. So what's there is really this sense of a journey and it's, the journey that Beruz goes on, but it could be the journey of, of an Irish convict coming to Australia or someone coming from Vietnam after the Vietnam War or an Italian or Greek refugee fleeing the Second World War. It has that kind of shared Australian experience to it. Um, it describes you know, this journey in terms of the dimensions of the boat, the unfamiliar waves, waves of a foreign ocean. And, you know, I feel that when I'm 
in Europe, the water is different to when I'm in Australia, the light is different. So the first half of the work is really about this journey. Um, and then we get to the prison. And again, Beruz is describing his present prison experience, but it chimed with descriptions of the kind of water prisons on Norfolk Island where people were chained kind of into the water and as the tide rose, they would, you know, be more and more submerged. So it's this kind of, this exploration of the idea of a cage, um, a prison um, that then turns very philosophical. Beruz talks about, you know, the absurdity of life and it, the end of the work moves into this contemplation of, of human nature more and more. So that's, yeah, the rough trajectory of the work through the music. We'll pick up this conversation again in just a moment. If you've just tuned in, you're listening to Smart Arts and I'm chatting with Baruz Bashani, Omid Tofigian and Luke Stiles about the uh, song cycle, symphonic song cycle adaptation of Baruz's acclaimed book, No Friend But the Mountain, writing from Manus Prison. We'll just listen to a couple of sponsorship announcements and I'll be right back. Triple R is the station you're tuned to, 102.7 on your FM dial and streaming around the world at rrr.org.au. And if you're just joining us, uh, we are discussing the world premiere of No Friend But The Mountains, a symphonic song cycle, uh, a collaborative piece uh, inspired by uh, Baruz Bashani's award-winning book, No Friends But The Mountains, writing from Manus Prison. Baruz, the uh, decision to subtitle the book, Writing From Manus Prison, rather than writing from Manus Island. Talk to us a little bit about that decision uh, and the, uh, the way you've chosen to explore in the book uh, the, uh, the idea of the, uh, I, the, I believe the phrase is, uh, is hierarchy, the um, uh, social systems of domination and oppression, which Manus really seemed to be set up to do. It wasn't just a place to hold people, the way you write about it, it was a place to break people down. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, that is a very good point, important point that you mentioned that uh, that prison system was not designed to just hold people. It was designed to really uh, take people identity and dehumanize them and actually humiliate them and reduce them to a number. And in the end, through this uh, systematic torture, they forced them to go back to their countries, forced them to uh, accept that send us back to our own countries and to the place that the refugees really uh, fled. And I think that is very important. So the main, uh, uh, one of the key concepts in this book is uh, the concept of a critical system, which uh, actually this uh, is really, is about the system of control, that how the system was designed to control people and also to divide our own uh, the small community, create hate between uh, our small community and create competition between the detainees. And uh, uh, that is the whole, that you really, it is a system of control that the, their aim in the end, their aim is that the detainees really don't feel uh, life, don't feel freedom, even for a second. So that is the whole uh, system. And so later I and Omid, we developed uh, another concept, Manus Prison Theory, which uh, we say that how uh, there are many similarities between Manus Prison System and uh, in a free society like the, the other structures like airports, uh, education system, I don't know, universities, everywhere we have a kind of manus prison system. But we say that 
the original system exists in uh, Manus prison system and in Manus Island, and we should really study that. We should try to understand it. And the aim of the book actually was that, to expose this system. So that's why sometimes I say that this book is a, uh, like a kind of psychological and uh, it is a sociological uh, text, you know, and a political text just to expose the soul of that system. So uh, that is what, of course, I use the, the, the quite special term for the title, No Front But The Mountains, which is uh, related to a Kurdish term that Kurds uh, know how, don't have a friend but the mountains. You know, so that is related to the history of resistance in Kurdistan against uh, in front of colonialism. Yeah. And also the prism, the word that I use for that actually was uh, to challenge the language of uh, propaganda, the language of the media and the language of the uh, politicians that they say this place is a offshore processing center. No, it's not offshore processing center. It is a prison. It is a place worse than a prison. So that is the whole story. Omid, how quickly did you become aware when you were editing the book that you were indeed editing uh, uh, something which is as uh, Baruch has just told us, that is a it's a philosophical textbook, uh, a political textbook, as much as a memoir or a story. Oh, um, I'm certain. Uh, I was certain that this book was uh, multi-dimensional. Um, it was uh, a, a huge contribution to history and literature. I was certain of that even before I started reading it. It was when I um, came across Behrouz's journalism. When I read his journalism, um, uh, first of all, the article that Munis translated and I uh, found out about Behrouz, and then when I started translating Behrouz's journalism, I realised that there were different layers of meaning um, that were um, being represented, uh, and uh, these included uh, philosophy, politics, um, um, testimony, but also um, poetry, uh, culture. Um, there was a, a sensitivity to different forms of oppression um, throughout history, um, different people's plights. And the more Behrouz became familiar with Australia's history, we, uh, he started to um, make reference to, and some, sometimes explicitly, uh, sometimes implicitly, to um, the dispossession, displacement, and ongoing suppression of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in Australia. So this was something that I became familiar with before I started on the book. Um, but when I I got the first chapter um, and I started reading. I think I was two or three pages into it and I said to myself, this is going to be a masterpiece. I'm so glad I didn't um, uh, turn down the opportunity to translate this because uh, I knew from the beginning that um, it was going to be something special. It was going to be a, a part of Australian history. It was going to be a part of the history of, of displacement in the modern world, uh, displacement and exile in the modern world. It was also a, a, an important abolitionist text. I think this book says a lot about um, abolitionist um, perspectives and philosophies and actions. And, uh, and I just felt uh, really honoured to be part of it. I thought to myself that if I don't do anything else for the rest of my life... Uh, I'm fine. I'm good. This is um, this is what I want to be remembered for for translating this. Luke, as a, a composer, I want to ask about the challenge of reflecting a uh, and I guess adapting a book, which, as we've just heard, is about so many things, including Australian history, which you've previously previously expressed kind of interest in. Uh, but how do you create? the musical idea of a system of control, of a, a beautiful prison, to echo some phrases that we've heard used in this conversation. Having spoken to you in the past about uh, the Ned Kelly opera, for example, I know that you in, incorporated the existing folk songs into that work, for example. Mm -hmm. You deliberately wove in uh, kind of percussive music to represent the, the forging of the armour uh, and so forth. So what's been your approach in the, the musical adaptation and creation 
of No Friend But The Mountains, a symphonic song cycle? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think to start with, you know, you need to see them as two separate works, that the book is its own work and this piece of music is its own work. And there's an obvious link, which is the use of the text. But there's things that are much better expressed in words and in the book than would be expressed in music. And, you know, the complexity of some of these political ideas and philosophical ideas and systems, um, you could translate them into music, but they're not the things that that I've translated or, you know, attempt to, to kind of find a, a connection with my voice because, you know, I can't tell Beruz's story. I can't, I don't have a lived refugee or asylum seeker experience and I wouldn't kind of try and create a work that attempted to you know express that experience because it's not my story um what did chime with me and what i have tried to turn into music is where beru's story feels part of a continuum part of a recurring australian identity trait of imprisonment of migration and that sense of isolation be it forced isolation in a prison or whether it's the beautiful isolation of living in a on an island continent that allows for the the really extraordinary kind of flora and fauna and geography that is embedded in our sense of Australian identity as most of us are coast dwellers um, or we have an imagined kind of perception of the outback which also forms our Australian identity and picking up on the beauty of that, which is in Beruz's text as well. So those are where a lot of the musical image making comes from. There's, there's very clear senses of, of, of the water, of kind of peaks and troughs, of highs and lows within the orchestra that are kind of word painting to a certain extent. Um, but then there's there's music that goes incredibly dark as we look inside the prison and there's there's rhythmic music that comes out of the repetition that's in those descriptions of the prison. Um, percussion certainly plays a large role in that. Um, we also have the choir. There's, I mean, the piece is massive. It's a huge symphony orchestra. I was originally told the choir would be about 180 people on stage. With COVID, we've got a few left, but it, less, sorry. But it's still a massive number of voices on there. And they actually sing, you know, fragments of the Australian anthem here and there. Well, they don't actually sing any words of it. They just hum some kind of styles variation of the anthem. Um, so they're kind of a community voice in a way. Whereas Adrian, the bass baritone soloist at the center is, if there's any narrative in what I've written, he's the voice that embodies that. Um, he's not, you know, he, he's by no means Beruz's voice, but he is the voice that's, that's leading us musically through the piece from these moments of, of beauty when we hear about, you know, the waves, the trees, the sun, the chukka bird, um, into then the moments of real darkness. If we're talking about voice, this then perhaps a, a question for both uh, Baruz and also you, Omid, is uh, the the idea of adapting a voice to create a different emotional response in a reader, whether that's the voice you use in journalism, the voice you use in poetry, the voice you use in adapting a work for a song cycle, for example. I'm imagining you have creative input into the, the lyrics of the piece, for example. How, do you, how conscious are you about kind of having to adapt the existing voice that is the book uh, for an entirely new framing, an entirely new emotional context? The... I think uh, I should talk about this in uh, two uh, levels. The first one is that I think what is important in this project, in this work, is that uh, I like the way, uh, I mean, the Luke's uh, uh, perspective towards this uh, book. So he actually, he is not really just follow. Uh, the book. He is not just uh, interpret or, I mean, shift the book and create uh, to a music. Actually, he 
uh, contribute the Australian perspective uh, with the book. You know what I mean? I mean, it is like a contribution. So he's, uh, he is talking about the identity, identity of Australia. And his perspective is a historical perspective too. And I feel that is my understanding. He has a kind of nostalgia. So he can talk about it later. Uh, a nostalgia about the history of Australia and the way people have come to this country and the way people actually contribute. And what we are talking about, I and Omid actually, we say, I think that is very important that uh, really people didn't talk about it yet, that uh, Manu's prison system, Naro, all of these prison system are a part of Australia, are a part of Australian identity. And I say that it is the Manus Island is the uh, unconscious part of Australia, you know, and uh, that has an impact, a huge impact on political culture in Australia. And in other side, we contribute to the Australian society through this work and other works. And also the Australian people resist in front of the system. You know, I mean, this work actually is uh, rep representing the voice of uh, Australian people who are really angry, who are really cannot and don't want to accept this and they reject this uh, uh, horrible uh, policy towards the refugees, the way the system treats the refugees. And it is a, like a kind of resistance. And I think Luke the, is resisting in front of this system through this book. And that's why I like this book because it's not the voice of the book. Actually, the book creates a space for him to uh, create this music, which has a, its own particular identity, which is an Australian identity. It's not my voice or the refugee's voice, actually. I think that is very important. And of course, another thing that I want to mention is that you talk about the why is important to uh, create a music. I think it's very important why, because we are talking, we are recording a part of Australia history, which uh, the system always denied. You know, if you look at the history of Australia, the system, the Australian mentality is like that they just deny. They say, oh, we didn't do this. Or even we did that, but it was not horrible like that, that you say. And uh, it's very easy that people forget about it because the whole story is about marginalized people. It's about the, I call it the unofficial part of Australia history. So it's very easy that people forget about it. You know, so what we are doing actually and what Luke did is that we create another work uh, which uh, in a different language, in musical language, and that actually we uh, record a part of Australia history in a different language, in a different platform. And I think that, and we are continue, we, we are working on this, so our we are working on a play which is coming out, a journal is coming out, a movie. So we are working on, but we won't stay here just on this book. So we are creating new opportunities. And I think that is very important. I, I, I like this book, this uh, work. I mean, the, the idea of creating this work is important. And the way look. Uh, look at it. I really like that. 
Amit, we're almost out of time. Do you want to pick, quickly pick up on any of those points? Yeah, just very quickly. I think Better has explained it really well. But um, uh, on the issue of voice, what was important for me while I was translating was to uh, constantly be in consultation with Better, to collaborate with him, to... to um, uh, ask him for different leads and different um, symbols and, uh, and inspirations to help me with my translation. So this led me on a, a long journey. Um, and uh, part of that journey was uh, in analyzing and, and researching uh, Kurdish resistance and Kurdish history and Kurdish literature and storytelling traditions. And so um, this helped with the translation because I was able to bring those voices you know, um, uh, I, I was able to bring in a lot of Indigenous Kurdish presence into the book. And, uh, and of course, other uh, marginalised groups, which Better has referred to as well. M myself, I'm from a, a, a different marginalised group in Iran and, of course, in Australia. Um, uh, and, you know, with these, all, all we, we leveraged all of these experiences and identities to make the book really strong, really powerful, and to speak to many people with multiple voices. So I think um, what uh, what Luke is doing is actually introducing more voices, uh, enhancing or amplifying the voices that are there, but introducing more voices so that more people can identify with the with the form of resistance that it represents. Um, just one last thing is uh, that I, I, I really believe that uh, in a situation where uh, that is uh, that is based on that's controlled by suppression, domination, and also subject subjugation, uh, I, I think it's important that to acknowledge that time is taken away from people, and the, one of the best ways of reclaiming time is by introducing new rhythms, new patterns, uh, and I think music does that really well. Speaking of time, we are going to have to wrap up the conversation. I am uh, very sorry, but I should just remind people that the world premiere of No Friend But The Mountains, a symphonic song cycle presented uh, by Zelman Symphony Orchestra, Art Centre Melbourne and the Wheeler Centre is taking place on Sunday, the 21st of March at the Sydney Meyer Music Bowl as part of Art Centre Melbourne's Live at the Bowl Summer Festival. For more information, go to liveatthebowl.com.au or zelmansymphony.org.au AU and you can book tickets through Ticketek 132849. You've been listening to Baruz Bachani, Luke Styles, and Omid uh, Tofigian in conversation live on Triple R. Thank you to everyone who's been listening or been watching via the Triple R website and YouTube page. If you missed the chat, you can listen back via radio on demand or watch it on Triple R's website and YouTube channels. Baruz, Luke and Omid, thank you so much for joining me on the program today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure is mine. Thank you. And given that the sex, uh, sorry, that the dead Kennedys were mentioned earlier as being uh, a bit of a link in the development of this work, I thought we might hear a dead Kennedys track now. Good till the side effects fuck up something else 